the last day, we were basically leaving off and uh, it started talking about the digestive system. And of course, uh, there are many, many, many different types of organisms that live there. Uh, hundreds, possibly up to a thousand have been classified and there may be many more than that. Um, but many of them are part of a pretty common list. And uh, some of these things that we've talked about already, E. coli, of course, is part of your intestine. And um, you can see on this list, uh, a bunch of the usual suspects, we have uh, enterococcus, even staphylococcus can get into the digestive system. And a number of these things are potential pathogens. So we talked about Clostridium difficile and uh, Candida, which is uh, yeast. There is more than one Candida besides the one that causes uh, brush and um, yeast infections. And so it's a big long list of, of organisms. And I had also mentioned that uh, having a good diversity of gut organisms is healthy for you as well. So we'll talk about probiotics in a minute, but a few other things about the uh, digestive system. You can see uh, this is kind of talking about uh, what a typical uh, gut bacterial composition looks like in a, in a usual person. And so you can see that the big groups there are these uh, phylums, don't need to know these names, bacteroides and uh, firmicutes. And so um, the uh, bacteroidetes is uh, gram negatives. And so that does include E. coli. There's a few there that we're not really talking about in this course, uh, Enterobacter, Klebsiella, and Proteus, which are important gut pathogens and can also, which can also be important gut pathogens. And uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is on that list. Uh, the other big group are the firmicutes, and uh, these include a whole bunch of gram positives, so Bacillus and Clostridium. We've talked about uh, Enterococcus, I've mentioned a few times, Lactobacillus and uh, Staphylococcus, and there are, there are a few others on that list. Uh, point is, there are a lot of different organisms, and uh, we, uh, we go through a lot of them every day. You know, we, uh, things pass through our, our digestive system, and and you can see there's a number there that we apparently eliminate approximately 100 trillion in one bowel movement, which is really quite an incredible number of organisms. Not all of our feces is, of course, bacteria. We have other things in there. Uh, we have things like cellulose that doesn't get digested. The brown color in your feces is from uh, used up red blood cells and, uh, and a few other things like that that we're not digesting. So E. coli actually makes up a very, very small percentage of that a population, about 0.1%. So what is the big deal about E. coli? Well, it turns out E. coli is super easy to grow in a lab and uh, it's found in everyone. So it turns out that's one reason why it's very well studied and also why uh, it's important because it is found in, in all humans. In fact, all warm-blooded animals have E. coli. So there is a bit of a change uh, of your gut composition as you age and go through different stages in life. You can see uh, that uh, infants uh, are still, uh, you know, they're getting exposed to all sorts of organisms and it takes a while before the dominant ones really do take over. And uh, other life changes like pregnancy or disease can change your gut composition. And it's really important to have a good diversity as we get older, which is why I had mentioned last day, that it's important we eat our fruits and vegetables and get our fiber. And uh, this is why a lot of older people have issues uh, and need to eat fiber because their gut diversity has, uh, has decreased. Fiber is also good just to get the bowel movements going too, uh, which is another reason why old people, uh, older people uh, require lots of fiber. So um, I mentioned there have been a bunch of uh, really fascinating studies done on gut flora. And this is a really interesting one. This actually is a number of years old now. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot we still don't really understand about this. Like I had said before, when studying gut microbes, uh, we got a lot of interesting data in rodents. Uh, and these are studies you can't necessarily do in humans so easily. But uh, here was a study where they took these uh, notobiotic mice. So those are the sterile mice. They have no gut microbes. And they took um, microbial flora from humans, right? So. Uh, people of different body mass indexes. So it turned out that the, uh, the mice from the humans that were, uh, were uh, overweight or obese, uh, those mice, uh, for some reason, they ate a lot more food. Uh, they didn't seem to have as much impulse control. And uh, 
they became obese mice. Uh, so, I mean, this is again one of these chicken or the eggs kind of things, right? Where you kind of wonder, you know, is, is the mouse uh, obese because of its microbes or, you, you know, and the same thing with humans, we, you know, or, or, the, or we have those microbes because, you know, of other issues, right? And, and like I said, you can't do this in humans. You can't make a sterile human and then try to do this. Um, you know, and uh, there are a few studies going on trying to look at doing, uh, you know, microbial transplants. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, about whether that can help people with, uh, with weight loss and whatnot. Uh, but there's really still a big question mark around this. Uh, but like I said, some really fascinating studies done in rodents and asked some questions. Uh, some people believe it has something to do with the way our bodies absorb nutrients and, uh, and uh, send signals to the brains. Uh, and so that might have something to do with it. Uh, there's a lot of interesting studies looking at, for example, uh, you know, there are organizations like, uh, uh, like World Vision who will, uh, who will buy vitamins uh, for children and uh, that are, uh, you know, starving and impoverished in, in uh, developing countries. And um, they just don't seem to absorb vitamins very well. So maybe someday in the future, you know, the, it might have something to do with our microbial flora. Uh, and that seems to be one of these the strong hypotheses. So maybe in the future, we will not only give them vitamins, but we'll give them a good flora, some sort of probiotic or something like that. But again, like I said, there's so much we really don't know. But some fascinating stuff. So um, I'll get to probiotics in a couple of minutes. I just kind of want to finish discussing uh, microbes of the body. Like I said, there are many, many out there. Uh, and uh, so let's talk the urinary, about the urinary and reproductive systems. So uh, if you look at the uh, urinary system, most of the urinary system is considered to be sterile uh, because it's kind of a one-way stream, right? Uh, you know, urine is going out of the urethra and it's a little harder for things to get in. Obviously, the tip of the urethra, which is going to be exposed to the environment, uh, you know, is going to have some microorganisms in them. And uh, some of the, uh, the ones that are common, you can see that are on that list there. We've got Staphylococcus, again, no surprise. That's a skin organism. Pseudomonas, again, probably no surprise because Pseudomonas seems to be one of those organisms, kind of like Staphylococcus, that can sort of grow anywhere. I mean, it can grow on any body system. It can grow on plants, it can grow in the soil. Uh, it's very well adapted to, to growing in multiple environments, um, although it does require a little bit more moisture than, than the Staphylococcus and can be a potential uh, pathogen. Um, the, uh, the vagina is a little bit different than the urethra, um, and uh, it's uh, a bit of a different environment in terms of uh, what is going on. It's not like it's expelling uh, um, <laughs> urine all the time. Um, the vagina is, of course, uh, a moist environment. And uh, I think I'd mentioned before somewhere about, uh, about different organisms living there. One of them, of course, is candida, which is uh, yeast, which I'm surprised is not on that list. And uh, when uh, women have, uh, uh, some women, when they take antibiotics, uh, it kills the normal bacteria and allows the yeast to, to flourish, and that can lead to a yeast inf infection. One of the key bacteria in the vagina is this one here. So lactobacillus, and uh, you may have heard of uh, lactobacillus acidophilus. Uh, that is the lactobacillus that you find in yogurt. And um, the reason why I mentioned that is that yogurt has an acidic pH, and uh, the lactobacillus in the vagina is actually uh, kind of closely related to the one found in yogurt. It's not the same organism, but it also produces acid and makes it an acidic environment. And uh, so another time when women sometimes get yeast infections is uh, when they're sick from, for some or other reason and it kind of affects their body pH. And, uh, and that allows, again, the yeast to, uh, to flourish. So of course, potential pathogens, the list is many. Uh, there are many diseases that can, or many organisms that can cause um, urinary tract infections or uh, sexually transmitted infections and some of them do both. So if you're looking at uh, urinary tract infections, uh, huge number on this list, E. coli, Staphylococcus, uh, Chlamydia, Neisseria, uh, those are typically considered uh, sexually transmitted infections, but they can infect the urinary tract, uh, both in men and women. And um, 
I think I mentioned before, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, I had mentioned that uh, women tend to uh, um, have a little bit more urinary tract infections than men, and it's just a basic uh, piece of anatomy. Uh, if you look at the female urethra, it's uh, a lot shorter uh, than the male urethra, and uh, it's a lot closer to the anus. And so the anus, of course, is the, um, uh, you know, the, the source of many different organisms, and uh, the number one urinary tract infection organism is E. coli, unfortunately. And so uh, if it's coming out of the anus and it's close to, to the vagina, or the, sorry, the uh, urinary tract, um, that's, that's not good. And so, you know, that's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, when you, have, um, when you have children and if you have uh, girls in particular, you're probably going to, uh, you know, tell them which direction to wipe, right? You're going to wipe away from the urethra, not towards the urethra when, when, uh, when they're learning how to toilet train. Anyway, uh, there's a lots of opinions about there. Uh, I'll just say this other thing. Uh, there are studies on this. Uh, there are opinions about uh, things like uh, what materials of underwear women should wear. And if you are somebody who does have frequent uh, urinary tract infections, then cotton is the winner. And there are studies on that that show uh, you know, different materials actually will allow organisms to transport uh, from, from one anatomical site to the other. And, and cotton apparently is one of the better fabrics to have. So anyway, maybe you'll learn something there today. <laughs> so uh, let's just talk a little bit about these microbes and um, you know what they're doing there. Like I said, it's, it's a very good way to think about this as an ecosystem where you have these microorganisms and they're sitting there and they're living and they're, they're trying to compete for that environment. And so that we have a word for this and this word is called microbial antagonism. So that means they're competing for the same space. And uh, so your normal flora can actually protect you from pathogens uh, because they're competing for that space, that real estate, those nutrients, uh, that environment uh, with the pathogens. And they do this in a variety of ways. So I've got a little list here of some of the ways that they might protect you. So one is just by occupying that space, right? If you have, uh, um, you know, that space, like you think about your, your intestine and you've got, uh, you know, that rich diversity of organisms, and Clostridium just doesn't have a chance to flourish because there's only so many nutrients to go around until, like I said, you maybe you take antibiotics and then you give it an opportunity. Um, some of these organisms produce acids. So I mentioned uh, lactobacillus uh, as, as important for the uh, human, human vagina and, uh, and not allowing uh, yeast to, uh, to flourish. And uh, so, you know, it produces acid and that makes, uh, makes it a lot less favorable for other organisms. Producing bacteriosins. So what is that? So this is one of these words, these sciencey words. Bacterio means bacteria, and it ends up with I-N. So you see a lot of proteins uh, end up with the word I, or the, the letters I-N. And so basically this just means proteins produced by bacteria. But uh, I'll give you a little bit of a better definition. So these are proteins. produced, and we'll say by bacteria, by bacteria. So these inhibit the growth of other bacteria. So I'm kind of running out of space there, but I'll say one more thing about these is that they often will uh, inhibit the growth of kind of closely related species uh, of which may be pathogenic, right? So um, um, I don't have a specific example uh, for this one, but uh, you know, this is just something they do. They claim, they, uh, they stake their claim, they produce uh, something that is uh, not toxic to them, but toxic to other organisms. And this is good. We want these things, we want the good ones to flourish, and the bad ones do not flourish. So this kind of brings us to probiotics. I've kind of mentioned them a few times uh, already. And uh, so the idea of probiotics has been around um, for a while now, uh, not like a long time. Uh, we used to think about the idea is that, okay, we have these, these germs, we have these bacteria, let's just kill them all. Um, but, uh, you know, somewhere around, I would say it was maybe the 1990s, 
uh, people started to think a bit more about this concept of, you know, maybe we want to allow the good bacteria to flourish. And uh, well, maybe we could find a way to apply good bacteria, right? Uh, you, know, exp you know, give our bodies the good ones. And so of course, you know, um, this led to uh, a little bit of research here and there, and I'll talk about some of the, the research in a moment. But if you think about um, some of these products like yogurt, yogurt already had bacteria in it. So the, um, the yogurt industry kind of just, uh, they stepped right on this and they said, hey, we have bacteria. These things must be good for us because we've been eating these for like a thousand years or whatever. And um, so uh, this led to a little bit of research. This has led to a lot of, uh, a lot of claims. And, um, uh, and, and so that's something I want to talk about a little bit. And, and I, find, um, I find probiotics really fascinating because uh, every time I'm in the grocery store, I, I'm like discovering a brand new product that's some sort of probiotic apparently uh, that I've never heard about before. Um, somebody asked a question, says, can uh, bacteriosins be referred to as inhibitors? Uh, yeah, I would, I would call them inhibitors. I don't know a lot about their mechanism of action, but they're inhibiting the growth of other organisms. Um, some mechanism. So here's, here's a few. Uh, like I said, you're probably familiar with yogurt and a lot of them, I picked these ones here uh, because particularly you can see that the Dan Active there, right, has, is talking about uh, your immune system here. And unfortunately, it's a little blurry, but uh, Activia as well has a lot of claims. You go to their website, they talk about all the research. You can see the note, it says it's probiotic yogurt. And apparently they're probiotic chocolate bars. So, uh, hey, that's all right. Chocolate's a good thing. So let's talk about some of these claims and other things. Uh, I found this product here in, I think it was the Edmonton Airport. Yeah, a few years ago, I was uh, gonna buy a package of gum and this was right there with the gum. And I was like, oh, this is interesting, the friendly bacteria. And uh, so what is this all about, right? So I was looking at this and uh, uh, this particular um, product, so it says it has bifidobacterium in it and uh, 5 billion active cells. I don't know if that's per tablet, but they're chewable tablets. And they're saying that they're gonna help you with traveler's diarrhea. So, you know, sometimes people get traveler's diarrhea. And of course, that's something that's gonna clean out your intestine. And what you wanna do is get it established uh, with some good bacteria um, if you do get traveler's diarrhea. So it was unclear whether they're uh, recommending that you take this before you travel or after you get the diarrhea, um, but maybe, um, maybe it has some more information on the website. I haven't looked in a while. So that's one of the claims, right? They can help us with digestive issues, particularly traveler's diarrhea. Uh, I saw this one too. Um, I have no idea how probiotic coffee works because coffee you heat up and presumably kill the bacteria. I didn't really look into this one, but it was an interesting product I saw. I'll show you a couple more products and then I'll go back to the claims in a moment. I got this uh, in the mail. Um, this is Popeye's uh, supplement place. And uh, I realized they have a lot of things and there's a, they're right there on the front page with some sort of probiotic um, powder or something like that for making smoothies. So I thought that was interesting. And again, you can see their claims, immune system function and digestive health. So these kind of claims come up again and again. Um, here's a couple others I saw in the grocery store, right? Uh, actually, I. I even tried these baby puffies. They're uh, little yogurt puffies. They were, they were quite delicious. Um, don't buy them regularly, but uh, I did try some one day. They were fun. Um, you know, lots of these products that I don't know a ton about, right? But you can see they're, they're talking about, uh, you know, the word probiotic on there. These products have been around for uh, a long time, right? Uh, you know, kefir uh, is just, it's similar to kind of like a, a yogurt. And, um, like I said, a lot of these products have been around for a long time. Um, some of them you may enjoy. And of course, you know, now they're getting extra popularity because, hey, they might be the new superfood or they might help you with your health. So uh, like I said, I want to kind of talk about some of the claims. And uh, there are a few organisms out there, but these are kind of usually the main ones that are found in these products. So lactobacillus, um, we're looking at uh, usually that's in uh, yogurts and a few other fermented foods, uh, bifido. Uh, bacterium also in yogurts, and Saccharomyces, which is found uh, in, uh, in a lot of supplements and some beverages. And uh, if, you, if you take a look, uh, these are kind of the main claims, right? Uh, usually around digestion and immune function. 
So probably the digestion one makes sense, right? You're taking organisms and you're putting them in your digestive tract, right? Uh, and so maybe they're gonna, like I said, establish a good population and maybe get rid of the bad population. Uh, what about immune function? So it turns out that, uh, um, believe it or not, you have a lot of immune cells in your digestive tract, huge number of them. And so there may be some benefits uh, to doing this. And uh, that's where things are getting a bit more of a stretch. You can see there's other claims here, reducing anxiety. Uh, I can't remember where I got this table from, but uh, you know, how would, how would we, you know, how do bacteria affect our anxiety? Well, again, we have nerves that go right from our brain all the way to our digestive system. And some of these organisms are producing uh, a neurotoxin, or not neurotoxins, sorry, neurotransmitters. Um, so maybe, um, you know, this is kind of a bit of a stretch, I think. So I put together this table here, and this is kind of my analysis of the research. And you can see the claims, and uh, the bigger the yes, the stronger the claim. So there have been good research done on some of this digestive health stuff. Um, it's not as simple as it might seem. Uh, I mentioned before that your digestive system benefits from being extremely diverse. So giving you a little bit of lactobacillus, how is that gonna help? Um, and, and so it helps a little bit. Like I said, it's about real estate, getting rid of the bad organisms. But in, in the end, really what you want is not to just consume one organism, you want to be having a diverse, uh, a diverse ecosystem in your gut. So there is some research that, that shows that it does uh, help with gut health. Uh, again, it's not 100% yes, because, well, it turns out we're all different people. The human population is very diverse. Uh, we have different habits, we have different genetics, and uh, every single one of these studies, uh, you're looking at, you know, it helped like 60% of the people, or 40%, and then the other people, it didn't help at all. Uh, some are much worse. You can see I have a, a note there about urogenital uh, urinary tract infections. Uh, there's been a couple of good studies. You know, I know uh, there's been a lot of marketing um, with yogurt to, uh, marketed towards women in particular. And uh, there's a little bit of truth to this. There have been a couple of good studies done that uh, um, there's some women who get uh, frequent urinary tract infections uh, and reoccurring. And often it will be uh, um, somewhat synced around with their monthly cycle. And um, so uh, there have been a couple of studies that show that uh, regular consumption of yogurts do help some of these women. Uh, I can't remember what the percentage is, but uh, there is some suggestion that it does help some people, but again, not all people, we're all, we're all very different, fortunately. What about the immune system? I know Activia was uh, part of a lawsuit making claims about the immune system, and I think they lost and had to pay out, and they've kind of backtracked a little bit on it. They're a little bit more hypothetical with their language, saying that it, it could help immune health and things like that. Uh, like I said, we, we, we don't know. Um, there, there's so much we don't know. And I've, I've seen so many other claims around probiotics about, uh, about mental health, um, decreasing the incidence of colds, allergies, and eczema. I saw that on a website somewhere, and I highly doubt it. Unless you're applying microorganisms to your nose where the cold virus is going to be, um, or your skin where eczema is going to be. I mean, like maybe, maybe someday we'll, we'll have that. We'll have some sort of uh, bacterial spray for your skin that can help you alleviate eczema. Uh, who knows? We're still at a very early stage of actually understanding this stuff. It's very, very complex. Like I said, you got a thousand organisms there. Um, you know, that's going to take us some time to really tease out what is going on. Uh, and it, it's like any ecosystem, very complex interactions going on as well. So, but maybe someday we'll figure some things out and we'll get better at this. Um, so I wanna talk about one kind of, um, I guess you could throw in the category of probiotics. Um, this is something that has gotten a lot of press in the last 10 years and it's called a fecal transplant. So, <laughs> um, you know, what, what does that mean? It means that sometimes people, uh, you know, they, they, need to, um, they need to get their, their gut colonized with a healthy sample. And uh, what is the best way to do that sample? Get all the diversity. A lot of these organisms are not culturable. We don't know how to grow them in the lab. So what you do is you get a stool sample from a healthy individual and you give it to the person with the unhealthy um, gut. 
there are different ways to do this. Uh, you can imagine there's two ends to the body uh, and both methods have been used. And, uh, and, and this is um, getting a lot of traction, uh, it turns out, because uh, it, it seems that there's a, a number of things that this actually has been highly successful at treating. And the big one, big one is one of our superbugs is Clostridium difficile. So I had mentioned that this thing is difficult uh, to treat, difficult to get rid of by antibiotics. Uh, my friend had this a few years ago, and I am not sure how many rounds of antibiotics he went through, and he was sick for, you know, probably more than two months. And uh, I don't know what the number is exactly, how successful clostridium treating is, but with the antibiotics, it is less than 95%. I think it's more like 60% or something like that. And um, so starting about 10 years ago, there were a few people, th this is actually a really old procedure. It was done way back uh, by some doctors, kind of in, I think in the 1920s or something like that. But for, it was, Clostridium difficile wasn't so common back then for some reason. Anyway, antibiotics showed up and kind of people forgot about this. And uh, about 10 years ago or so, people, uh, some, some physicians started trying this again. And, and there were no clinical procedures for this at the time. And, uh, but the initial studies show a 95% success rate, people getting cleared of their Clostridium difficile infection, 95%. Like, that's incredible. I mean, how many things in life are 95%? Um, you know, that's great. Uh, so um, it's, it's a pretty fascinating kind of story because 10 years ago, there were a few doctors, I think in Canada, there were like five doing it in Canada. And... There's, there's no money for this kind of research, right? You know, the pharmaceutical companies, they want a drug. You can't sell your husband or wife's poo, <laughs> right? Um, it's it's kind of just, you know, but some kept plugging away at it and kept publishing. And, and now we're at the point where uh, in some hospitals, this is getting to be quite routine because you can't deny 95% success rate. That's amazing. Um, and so, uh, and people are starting to look at, at, at doing it for uh, treating other, um, other ailments as well. So I just wanted to address a question or two. Somebody's asking, is the fecal matter filtered before transplant? I think there's a couple different procedures. I think uh, one of the common ones people do is uh, it gets resuspended in like a saline solution or something like that and usually gets screened. Uh, the typical procedure is it would be from somebody that you, uh, you live with. Um, you know, and uh, uh, presumably is, is free from, uh, you know, any other infections. Um, so often a spouse or something uh, might be the, uh, the donor. Um, but like I said, I think there's a few different procedures around it uh, in terms of, uh, of the treatment. I'm not 100% sure about it. Somebody mentioned they saw it on uh, Gray's Anatomy. So that's great. You know, I guess these uh, medical shows do try to keep up and, you know, with all the cutting edge technology. <laughs> Kind of funny to call this cutting edge, but I guess it is. Um, so like I said, there's been a bunch of other studies here uh, trying to look at it, treating other things. I, I saw this, uh, this article, uh, and I, I've heard about it a couple of times. I didn't read the original research on this one, but uh, um, children with autism apparently uh, will often have um, uh, digestive discomforts. And I think the more extreme the autism, the more extreme the digestive discomforts. Uh, so this is an article written by a physician, and he did a small scale, I think small, like less than 10 uh, patients, and gave them fecal transplants. And these were all children with extreme autism. And uh, it, um, their behavior improved uh, for like a month or two after the fecal transplant. And um, so very small study, but preliminary results, uh, lots that we don't really understand here, uh, but, uh, but very fascinating, right? Um, again, you got a connection between the gut and behavior, uh, which is something that we're sure there's a connection, um, but how, you know, teasing out all the details is really, uh, really, really complex. Okay, so let's talk about um, these organisms and uh, I want to talk about uh, opportunistic infections or opportunistic pathogens. So um, if you think about those relationships we were talking about, uh, you know, we have organisms that might be um, uh, mutual with us, mutualism or commensalism, but these relationships can change and uh, they can become pathogenic under the right circumstances. So what kind of circumstances are we talking about? Uh, the obvious one is immune suppression, right? Your immune, your immune system is beaten down 
Uh, maybe you are malnourished or you're getting uh, an organ transplant or you have AIDS and that can lead to infections from organisms that wouldn't normally infect a healthy individual. Sometimes we have a change in our normal flora. We've talked about this a whole bunch of times, how antibiotic treatment can lead to yeast infections or sometimes clostridium difficile infections. Uh, and another big one is uh, the normal organisms going from one anatomical site to another part of the body. So the classic one, like I said, is E. coli, which is harmless in your gut, uh, ending up in your urethra. And one more, other complications. There's, there's lots of other complications out there. People with cystic fibrosis have uh, extra thick mucus in their lungs, which makes them uh, uh, more likely to get certain types of infections uh, in their lungs. If you take a look at the textbook, it's got a big list of uh, all sorts of uh, things that, that would uh, lead to opportunistic infections. I kind of took that list and, um, and, and thought of it in terms of, of four categories. Oh, there's my phone, sorry about that. Uh, and so it's talking about, you can see all these, these uh, categories do fit in the other, other, uh, other areas, right? Immune suppression um, or just not having a developed immune system yet, being a, an infant or, um, or being elderly where the immune system does start to get beaten down, things like that. So these opportunistic infections, like I said, are, are a very important uh, part of healthcare because we're trying to prevent them and sometimes we're trying to deal with them. So let's just talk about Clostridium difficile for a moment. I found this little cartoon. I just want to talk about kind of the mechanism of it uh, because uh, we've, been, we've been talking about quite a bit here. So Clostridium difficile uh, can produce a, uh, a diarrhea uh, and it can be crampy and painful in some cases. And uh, I've heard that it, uh, the smell is extremely bad, um, like rotten eggs. So what is going on here? I mentioned this before, right? You know, sometimes we, uh, we may have this in our gut already. It's also possible that if you're in a hospital environment that you may get colonized by somebody who has it because these endospores are very stable in the environment and they're very stable in the gut. So you can see in this case here, it looks like this person is taking uh, some antibiotics and there's certain ones that are, um, uh, are really good at wiping out a lot of your gut flora. This clindamycin, I know we didn't talk about clindamycin, but it's one that comes up again and again with clostridium infections. People get clindamycin and the side effect is the clostridium takes over. Um, so uh, I think it's just a strong um, broad spectrum antibiotic. So they take that, the endospores are fine, and there it is, clostridium is growing and he's looking really nasty, and um, he has a toxin and that toxin um, causes damage to the intestinal cells, which lead to, which lead to the diarrhea. Okay, so uh, we wanna talk about infections and uh, what I wanna spend most of the rest of the lecture talking about is, uh, uh, you know, why we have, like, why is it that these organisms sometimes colonize us and we're fine, and then other times we get sick, right? So I wanna talk about infections and pathogenesis. So infection doesn't necessarily mean, by the way, you're sick, uh, you can be infected and not sick, like typhoid Mary. Um, and uh, sometimes infections lead to secondary infections. Some infections can be local, some can be sy uh, systemic, meaning all over the body. Uh, so like I said, let's talk about uh, pathogenesis. So pathogenesis or pathogenicity means the ability of an organism to cause disease. Uh, here's a funny thing that happened to me once. Um, I typed in pathogenicity into Microsoft Word, and it tried to change it to pathogen city. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, so that word pathogenicity, the ability to cause disease, which is different than just infection. Sometimes we talk about virulence, which means the severity of disease. So this includes a whole bunch of confluence of events. And you can see I have them uh, kind of listed here, and this is usually called mechanisms of pathogenicity. I think in our textbook they call it requirements for infection, but like I said, I don't necessarily like the word infection because it doesn't necessarily mean you're having disease. Um, so that's a bit of a better term. So I wanna kinda of cover um, all of these areas and uh, talk about uh, why they're important for organisms to cause disease. Because usually, you know, if you're missing one or two of these, the organism can't cause disease. So it's good to know about these things. So first thing there you can see is portals of entry. 
So hopefully it's kind of obvious that if the organism uh, cannot get into your body, it cannot cause disease, right? So we often talk about, uh, you know, these portals of entry and they're, they're kind of connected with uh, mechanisms of transmission. Uh, they're used kind of sometimes in the same sentence, right? And so there's a bunch of different body systems and different ways uh, for them to get in. Uh, one common way for them to get in is through the mucous membranes. So mucous membranes are uh, basically epithelium and connective tissue that line uh, certain um, body systems. So like your respiratory tract and your digestive system and, uh, and so on. And so these are also uh, portals of entry. So the oral route, something gets eaten or digested. Uh, the respiratory route, things get inhaled uh, or uh, sexually transmitted route as well. So all of these things, they can uh, uh, be a place for the organisms to gain access to the, uh, to the body. So you probably have know some examples of all of these. The oral route, of course, you know, a lot of um, foodborne illnesses. So salmonella with, with uh, food poisoning or, um, you know, waterborne diseases. So sometimes, you know, people are, uh, are, are getting a traveler's diarrhea from, from drinking contaminated water, respiratory route. Uh, COVID-19 is a good example of that, or uh, people getting tuberculosis or influenza and sexual route. We've talked about gonorrhea and chlamydia a little bit already. So I can't remember why I have those highlighted, but I guess I was going to talk about them. I already have a little bit. Uh, the skin is also a portal of entry. Uh, often it has to be broken. And uh, oops, sorry about that. Um, so, you know, the skin can be, can be broken by a scratch or it can be broken by an insect bite or it can be broken by, uh, you know, sometimes people do intravenous needles. And so you can imagine that, uh, you know, there's a number of organisms that if they can penetrate the skin and get under, um, under the first couple of layers, they can cause infections. So some skin infections can be not too bad. Some can be quite serious. Somebody mentioned cat scratch disease. So yeah, you get scratched by your kitten. There's also the placental route. Um, so the uh, placental route, um, there's, there's a small list of organisms that, that can do this. Uh, some organisms can travel mother to baby. Uh, a lot of those cases are during childbirth. Um, the placental route is specific organisms that can actually um, invade the placenta during pregnancy. Uh, these are some of the really important ones, uh, although Zika may be a little less important in Canada because you're not going to get it here. Right, but uh, toxoplasma we talked about as uh, being found in cat feces, and it can travel across a placenta and cause uh, uh, growth abnormalities. Um, so very, uh, very, very serious for the um, for the fetus. Uh, syphilis again being another one, which is why I mentioned I think it was last day uh, why you know we're concerned about women with syphilis because it can have uh, have serious effects on the on the baby. So I wanted to. Um, show you an acronym. Uh, I think I have enough room here on this slide. I'll do it on this room, on this slide. Um, there's a whole list of diseases that can travel mother to child. And, uh, oops, just that zoom thing is getting in my way. I need to move it. There we go. Mother to child. And there's an acronym for this. It's called TORCH. So T, O R C. I'll put the H down here. Uh, like I said, there's a big long list. There's another acronym I saw that kind of covered everything because um, so T is for toxoplasma. Toxoplasma. And unfortunately, the O is for other. And I'll get back to other in a minute, which is why, like I said, other people are coming up with um, some fancier acronyms. But uh, R is for rubella. So you may not know what rubella is. Um, rubella is part of the uh, um, MMR V vaccine. Uh, so mumps, measles, rubella, it's sometimes called German measles. And we don't see it because uh, very much anymore because of, um, because of vaccines, which is great. Um, but uh, rubella, you know, it's one of those diseases that was very serious uh, back in the day before vaccines. Um, pregnant women were, were scared of getting it because uh, it could go to the child, right? So another one here is, oh, come on. There we go. 
time I touch the screen, it thinks I want to go to the next slide. Cytomegalovirus. I'm not going to talk about that one too much. Um, it's more uh, serious when you're immunocompromised. And we got herpes simplex. And of course, we're talking about mostly herpes simplex too, right? Uh, genital warts, uh, because of course uh, they can get transmitted. And so these ones here don't necessarily mean uh, placental transmission. Uh, some of them are, are, um, are uh, transmitted during childbirth as well. So other, unfortunately, the other has gotten really big. And so, like I said, there's a few other acronyms out there, but that's an old one in the classic. And that includes, of course, syphilis, which is on this list here. Of course, now also includes Zika because uh, we know a lot about Zika now. Uh, what else is on that list? Mumps, again, a vaccine preventable disease. And uh, a notable one is, of course, HIV. So HIV, I think it's very rare for it to travel across the placenta, but a lot more possible for it to um, get transmitted to the child during childbirth. And uh, so um, usually women who are pregnant with HIV are going to get a high dose of antiretrovirals uh, leading up to the childbirth to uh, kind of minimize the viral uh, load in their blood and, and it's actually relatively safe nowadays, which is uh, which is really incredible So um, just a thing to think about in terms of portals of entry, right? Just because a pathogen enters your body. It doesn't mean it's going to cause disease. I have a couple examples here So streptococcus pneumonia Obvious causes pneumonia. So if it gets in your lungs, um, it can cause pneumonia. If it gets in your stomach In your gut, no disease uh, what about something like salmonella? So salmonella, uh, it causes digestive diseases. Uh, food poisoning can cause uh, typhoid fever. If it's on your skin, it's not really a big deal. So something to think about. Like I said, these organisms have to get to the right body part, and that's part of the formula for them causing disease. So second part is uh, something called infectious dose. And uh, so what does this mean? It means that... Uh, you know, you, you gotta have enough of them to make you sick, right? So uh, if you take a look at these numbers here, um, sometimes we use a term called infectious dose 50. Uh, that's usually determined in animals. And uh, that's defined as the number of pathogens required to cause disease in half of the animals or individuals. Um, everyone's different. So sometimes the infectious dose is gonna be different for a different human. Uh, but so it's a good estimate to kind of give us an idea how infectious something is. If you take a look at, uh, I have, uh, you know, two types of E. coli on that list. And most pathogenic E. coli, the type that give you traveler's diarrhea, you have to consume millions of them, like 10 million to get sick, which is really kind of gross if you think about it. If you end up going to um, Mexico and you drink the water and you get traveler's diarrhea, um, that means you've consumed millions of pathogenic E. coli, uh, which is just, you know, amazing to think about that, uh, that you've done that. Uh, E. coli 0157, we're going to talk about uh, probably today, we'll get to it. Um, this is a very pathogenic, very nasty version of E. coli, and uh, we believe the infectious dose is less than 100 cells. So you can see there's a huge difference there, right, in terms of what's going on. Uh, something like Giardia, uh, so beaver fever, I think you need at least, I can't remember if it's 100 or 1,000. And so sometimes they find it in the water, but the dose is so low and they know no one will get sick from it. Because if you just get one or two, you just, you just don't get sick from it. Uh, what about other organisms? You can see there's some numbers here for uh, cholera, uh, pretty high numbers again. Uh, inhalation anthrax, a little bit lower. Uh, what about viruses? Um, so papillomavirus, apparently it's around 10,000. Norovirus, 20. So at first I'm thinking, wow, that's crazy. So norovirus, by the way, um, is, is super infectious. And apparently you need very few virus particles to actually get sick. Uh, there's a couple of viruses out there that we think the infectious dose number may be one virus particle. That includes smallpox and one of the strains of Ebola. Again, you know, you can't do these studies. Um, but this is just estimates from, uh, you know, the, the available data, which is just absolutely terrifying. So this is something that is, that is a concern, right, with these things. Okay, so, um, oh, I see there's a question that popped up. Someone's asking, isn't smallpox eradicated? Yes, it is, so that's a good thing, right? Um, it is eradicated, yeah. 
there are uh, there are some samples in two labs in the world, um, but uh, it's something that um, we do know quite a bit about because it was a very important disease historically. So if you uh, get those organisms, they get to your body, they get to the right place, and they come there in sufficient numbers, they still have to find a way to attach and uh, you know form a colony, right? And so it's important for these cells to have uh, you know some sort of uh, system to attach. Um, so these things have a bunch of different names, adhesions, ligands, um, suckers, hooks. We talked about pili and fimbriae. So you can see here showing uh, E. coli on some human bladder cells. So I think I mentioned this way, way back, maybe in the second week of lectures, that um, some people get bladder infections and some people don't seem to get them that often. And that's because you have to have the right strain of E. coli. There's actually only a few strains of E. coli that can do this. And um, they have a, a pili, it's called the P pili, the letter P, and um, it's able to attach to, to bladder cells. And if, you don't, if you're not colonized with that particular E. coli, you're probably not going to get the bladder infection. It doesn't mean you won't get colonized someday in the future, but um, some people are unfortunately a little less lucky than others. Uh, like I said, there's lots of different names for these things. Uh, we also talked about the glycocalyx. So if you remember, the glycocalyx include the uh, capsules and the slime layers. Capsules and slime layers. And these are sticky carbohydrates. And they also help the, uh, the organism to evade the immune system as well. So the one on the left is, um, um, that's a streptococcus, and it's actually attaching to a tonsil cell, so giving someone some strep throat. Uh, we mentioned these, um, these uh, uh, helmets, these worms, and they have all sorts of suckers and hooks. And, and uh, you know, I, I don't even know how these things work. I kind of think of them like suction cups with little barbs on them. And um, when, uh, when they can't hold on any longer uh, due to certain drugs, that's when they, they uh, get released. And so that's one way for us to, uh, to deal with these things. Okay, so next part is they get there, they attach, and they you know, need to get inside sometimes. Um, and they also need to evade uh, host immune defenses, right? So maybe I should have broken this up into two categories, but uh, they're kind of uh, part and parcel of the same thing in some ways. So some things that we talked about, uh, we talked about these uh, apical, apical complexes. So this is found on the malaria parasite plasmodium, also found on toxoplasma and cryptosporidium. And this is like a specialized organelle that uses mechanical and, uh, and enzymatic um, uh, systems to penetrate. And so all these, all these organisms here, plasmodia, oxoplasm, crispridium, they live inside host cells, right? So when they get inside your cell, that's one good way to hide from the immune system. And, uh, and it works, right? And these things can, uh, can live and, and hide out for... Uh, you know, in the case of toxoplasma, you know, decades in your body, which is just like kind of crazy. Um, some of these organisms have, um, have enzymes and invasins. So there's, you know, IN again, right? That means a protein that is involved in invading. I don't really like that word. It's not so uh, specific. It's kind of vague, but it's used. And uh, you can see in this case here, they're, they're talking about... Um, some of these gram negatives, so salmonella and uh, uh, some of the pathogenic E. coli can invade these cells. So there's, there's a whole bunch of different mechanisms um, that, that, that this can happen and, and it's kind of not worth uh, getting into all these details. But in a lot of these cases, what they do is they can trick the host cell to bringing it in by endocytosis. And you can see in this case here, I don't know if that's supposed to represent salmonella, uh, but it binds to the host cell and tells the host cell, hey, bring me in, I'm food. And of course, the host cell is wrong, and it leads to an intercellular infection, which is not good. Uh, this was the um, photo, um, I think it was uh, on the cover of the first edition of this textbook. And uh, it's not the best photo, which I'm surprised I put on the cover, but it's showing a uh, treponema. So treponema is the organism that causes syphilis. And uh, I've mentioned it a couple of times, it's really good at penetrating different tissues, also kind of like Lyme disease. And this is why uh, syphilis starts off as a sexually transmitted disease, but then the later stages, it can invade other body systems and cause complications. 
So we did talk about one type of basin, which is the hemolysins. Uh, the hemolysins are enzymes that basically break open uh, your red blood cells. So that's one way of invading. In this case, the cells are not being invaded. They're just being broken open entirely to uh, release the contents, but it is uh, a type of invasion or an enzyme anyway that, that will uh, help the organism to uh, carry out its infection. Uh, a number of these will have uh, specific names that are named after different, uh, different functions. So you can see there's a coagulase for staphylococcus and uh, so coagulate, right? That's, that's where the word comes from. So this is kind of doing something a little bit different. You can see it's causing uh, basically a blood clot, right? And, uh, and then um, the blood clot is, uh, is dealt with and that actually helps the organism to invade the blood a little bit, which is kind of a weird thing. Again, don't want to get into a lot of detail on that. It, it just takes too long, um, but just an example. And there's a bunch of examples in the, in the textbook uh, if you want to take a look at them. Uh, bottom line is there's lots of mechanisms. Some of these break down tissues. You can see we've got uh, like collagenases, right? So collagen is connective tissue. You break down the connective tissue and then you can gain access to, uh, to the human host. But why are they doing this? Why are they being so mean? Well, they're just, they're just trying to find nutrients. They're just trying to make a home. And that's kind of what they're doing here. They're not necessarily trying to be nasty to you, but it helps if they can get uh, access to your nutrients. Uh, so you may have heard of um, flesh eating disease. So this kind of has a technical term, necrotizing uh, fasciitis. Um, and uh, this can be caused by our streptococcus. So there's our, um, there's our streptococcus pyogenes. This is the one that keeps coming up, um, often involved in strep throat, but very good at causing all sorts of other infections. And uh, so in this case, what's going on? It's, it's uh, excreting enzymes that is, is leading to, uh, you know, to tissue damage. So this is not very common to get, by the way. Uh, usually, I think um, it's associated with people being immunocompromised to some degree, but also with the organism getting deep into the tissues, which is you know, not usually necessarily happening with uh, the streptococcus. Um, so kind of going on with this concept of evading host defenses, we've talked about some of these things already. Of course, one of these things is capsules and slime layers, right? And uh, so, like I said, these are carbohydrates that are kind of uh, sticky, but they're also kind of slippery. So you can imagine grabbing onto something slimy. Well, it's hard for our immune cells as well. And uh, there are a whole bunch of organisms that do this, both gram positives and gram negatives. So streptococcus is probably one of the most common organisms that's very well understood because uh, if it doesn't have the capsule, uh, if, if I had a strain of streptococcus pneumonia, I could inject a whole bunch into your bloodstream and you'd be just fine. Um, we've done that in mice many, many times, but as soon as they have the capsule, the immune cells just can't grab on and the infection uh, in, in mice anyway is fatal. Just for the record, I never do that to any of you. Um, so how else can we evade the immune system? Well, we can, we can change our surface antigens, right? Um, so we, we talked about this with the flu virus, right? The flu virus, uh, it mutates. Uh, kind of slowly every year, and in particular, it mutates the uh, H and N, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase surface proteins uh, on, on the outside. Those are glycoproteins. So they mutate enough, and every year they're different enough that our immune system um, cannot prevent the infection. There are other organisms that do this as well. Um, plasmodium, which causes malaria, is able to do this. And uh, that makes it a lot harder to make an effective uh, malaria vaccine because uh, it has a genetic mechanism for changing the antigens on the surface. I'm less familiar with the plasmodium mechanism, but uh, I know it does happen. And so if you live in a malaria endemic zone, uh, it's possible you can get malaria once or twice a year, every year. And uh, eventually you do start building up some immunity to it, which is why it's a lot less serious in adults than it is in children. Um, but you know, you can, like I said, you can get many, many uh, malaria infections. And uh, it's because it's able to, uh, it's able to mix up its, uh, its surface antigens. Like I said, I'm not entirely sure how the mechanism works, but uh, it, it does it all on its own. So one other way to evade immune system is hide and hide inside a cell. So I think I mentioned this already, uh, like salmonella is a good example where when it infects your gut, it'll go right into your uh, intestinal cells, and hide there, and then causes all sorts of trouble. Um, 
Lots of diseases do this. You can see tuberculosis is another good example of that. It will actually hide in immune cells and, uh, and live and grow there. Plague is another example. Chlamydia is another example. I know there's some on this list that we're, we're not really covering, like leprosy, but uh, it's related to tuberculosis, so it's worth um, a mention. So a good way to hide from the immune system. Okay, so we're getting there. I know this is a lot of information for you today. Um, and um, I know that, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, technical words here for you. So uh, let me just finish this here and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, what some of these questions might look like on, on exam. But uh, um, just bear with me, we're almost there. So something else, you got your organism, it's, uh, it's made it to the body, it's gone in the right place, it's attached, it's uh, evaded the immune system. So what? I mean, our gut pathogens do this all the time. Uh, they're not necessarily causing us disease. So they still have to do something that is going to cause some sort of pathological thing. And, and this is usually some sort of damage to our body. And so we can classify these in a, in a, in a few different categories. But uh, um, often when people talk about uh, viremia, they'll talk about cytopathic effects. And this is damage due to the actual virus replicating. And so I think I have a picture here. Uh, and so you can see this is a picture of a... Um, I was thinking it was a pap smear, but it looks like it's a herpes simplex virus. And, uh, and so it's uh, those, those cells on the left here, right? Um, so this, this cell right here, oh, come on, silly PowerPoint. So these cells here are a little bit uh, more like normal cells, right? So you've got a cell, you've got a nucleus, and uh, when the virus invades, it just, it just takes over and it does nasty things to the cell. Some of these cells, you can imagine with herpes simplex virus, uh, you're getting blisters um, and, um, you know, cold sores or genital herpes because the cells are dying. Uh, sometimes the cells, you can see these ones here, they, they, the nuclei are, are big and fat. Uh, there are different shapes and sizes. And so th these are cytopathic effects, right? So when you get uh, influenza, think about the um, symptoms of influenza, right? Uh, you get a fever, for example. That's a classic symptom. That's not from the virus. That's from your immune system reacting and trying to deal with it. But the other classic symptoms are cough, right? Chest pain. That's the virus going down into your respiratory system and killing cells, literally wiping them out. And so you're coughing and you've got pain and all those kind of things. Uh, when, you, um, when you have a cold, you know, the runny nose part, that's the immune system trying to deal with and expel the virus. But, uh, you know, you get a sore throat. And again, that's the virus killing cells in your throat and that causes pain. Uh, some viruses are much worse. You probably have heard um, that sometimes people who have Ebola um, bleed out. It can be hemorrhagic sometimes. And that literally is the virus uh, just destroying cells all over the body, which is, which is uh, you know, really kind of scary. So that's what a cytopathic effect is. And depending on the virus, sometimes it's, 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 uh, it's, it's small with uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, the viremia, and, you know, and some people includes uh, chest pains and coughing. And, um, you know, and then some of the symptoms, again, like I said, are from our body trying to deal with it, the immune system, which we'll get to when we talk about the immune system. So going back to this list here, uh, we also talk about cytological effects and these will include uh, sometimes those tissue destroying enzymes and often a lot of things that we call toxins, right? So uh, let's talk about toxins here for a minute. Um, there are many, many types of toxins. And uh, often when we're talking about bacteria in general, we'll classify them as endotoxins or exotoxins. So what does that mean? What is an endotoxin? So endotoxin is part of the cell and uh, it's carrying out some sort of function and uh, it, uh, you, you know, and, and when, you, when you kill the cell, it gets released. So the, the, um, the most um, well understood and most common endotoxin, you can see from this note here, is part of the outer membrane. So we're talking about the LPS in gram negatives. So the LPS stands for lipopolysaccharide. Lipo saccharide. So what is this thing? This is part of the membrane. It's a lipid. It's kind of like a phospholipid and it's part of, it's part of, you know, the gram negative um, outer membrane. And uh, that's fine. The cell's got its thing going on. And the thing is though, 
if you get this organism in your blood and your immune system or you take, uh, you take uh, drugs and um, it's killing the organism and now you have a foreign molecule in your blood. Our human cells don't have LPS. We don't have that in our body naturally. And so our immune system looks at that and says, okay, this is something foreign. We got to react and we got to react now. And so uh, um, in some cases where people have blood infections and too much LPS gets released, and uh, uh, you might get septic shock. So what is septic shock? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's basically a, a reaction in the immune system. It can lead to a whole bunch of different things depending on how severe it is. Uh, things like low blood pressure, uh, fever, chills, and in some cases it can be actually quite extreme. Uh, and this is why sometimes people have blood infections and it's not recommended to treat them with antibiotics because it might release too much LPS, which will, um, you know, particularly in older people, uh, can actually be a fatal thing. So I think I have, um, yeah, here's the picture from the textbook showing in this case you've got, uh, um, it looks like an immune cell. It's taken in a bacterial cell by phagocytosis and um, the uh, endotoxin, the LPS is released, it's getting into the blood, and, and of course the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, immune system's not gonna be happy about that. The other scenario on the right is just the, the bacteria dying. Like I said, a classic is, is getting just treated by, by antibiotics. So um, that, can be, uh, that can be serious. Uh, in many cases, it is not. Uh, it's just something to be aware of. Um, a little bit more potent than endotoxins are exotoxins. So what is an exotoxin? It's something that is secreted by the cell. And some of them are waste products, some of them are um, you know, enzymes for invading tissues, and some can be very, very potent. Um, just something to note here, you can see I have uh, endotoxins are associated with gram negatives, exotoxins with gram positives. There are cases of uh, gram positive endotoxins and gram negative uh, exotoxins, but uh, kind of generally, this is, this is usually how, how, um, how they play out. Um, and most of the uh, really dangerous exotoxins, uh, many of them are from gram positives, and I'll talk about a few in a moment here. So there's our bacterium. It's releasing some sort of toxin, and you can see it's killing a bunch of uh, human cells here on the right. So there's a whole bunch here. And uh, I just wanted to show you this list from the textbook. You can see they're talking about anthrax has an exotoxin, and there's an enterotoxin from Bacillus cereus, and, and uh, something found um, from Clostridium uh, here that's causing gas gangrene and tetanus. So there's, there's a few of these I do want to mention here, and I've got some slides for them. So one of them to mention is the uh, botulinum toxin, and this causes botulism. So this is from a clostridium organism. So it's related to clostridium difficile. And uh, so there's the organism name, clostridium botulinum. And uh, just like uh, clostridium difficile, this is uh, uh, an endospore forming organism. And uh, this one here though, doesn't normally live in your gut. I don't think it can, it lives in the soil. So this here, uh, I don't know if you know what botulism is, but botulism can cause paralysis and can be quite serious. And sometimes it's associated with people eating uh, spoiled food. So that's not good. And uh, so, you know, this is something that we're concerned about in the food industry. And this is why uh, if you're ever, um, ever in a grocery store and uh, you, you see a canned good, and once in a while, um, I haven't seen this for years, but I've, 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 I've seen this a few times, uh, the can looks bloated. Um, and this is because the, the cooking process for the food didn't kill the endospores when the clostridium uh, is growing in there. Uh, I also remember a time, uh, you know, cleaning out my parents' pantry and finding one just like that. So given enough time, that's why even canned food does expire because they're concerned about uh, some of these organisms that may eventually grow in there. Um, yeah, so somebody's saying not canning stuff properly. Yeah, and, and so if you do your own canning, making jams and things like that, you know, you're, you're supposed to try to sterilize the, the jars by boiling them for a while and whatnot, and, and not every one of them is going to get um, sterilized. So sometimes, you know, you end up with growth or something, and hopefully it's not botulism. You don't want to eat that one, right, if you, if you see that it's not, uh, not looking good or smelling good. Hopefully that one's obvious. You may notice this, uh, this little diagram of the protein. Uh, from Wikipedia. Also goes by another name, this toxin, Botox. 
So um, yeah, this, uh, you know, this is one of these cases where we have an extremely dangerous toxin and we're using it for other things because in small doses, uh, it won't kill you necessarily. So um, this was, uh, I'll, I'll go come back to Botox in a moment, but I just wanna show you the mechanism here. Uh, you can see you've got a neuron, you've got a muscle cell, and you've got all these little uh, neurotransmitters and uh, these little neurotransmitters are crossing from the, uh, from the nerve to the, the muscle. And uh, so what does botulism do? The toxin, it basically blocks, blocks the neurotransmitters. And so paralysis, right? So this was um, thought of as a uh, therapeutic method uh, quite a number of years ago now. There are some people that have issues. Uh, you can see this uh, woman here, um, she has, uh, there's something going on with her nerves and, and she kind of, her face tenses and squints all the time. And uh, so, hey, let's just relax those muscles and we'll put in a very, very, very small dose of neuro, uh, of, uh, of a toxin, right? And, and it works, right? This is a local toxin. It doesn't spread through your blood very easily uh, and, it, and it paralyzes some of those muscles here. And so this woman here probably had chronic headaches and other issues. And, and quality of life uh, was improved. Of course, you know, it didn't take long before people realized, hey, you know what, her, her skin looks smoother. So um, interesting thing is when you, when you um, Google Botox, uh, you end up with, uh, I don't know how many types of celebrity uh, websites saying, yep, that person's on Botox, or here's a picture to prove it and all that. And anyway, I saw this one here, um, talking about uh, Hillary Clinton and um, probably, uh, wondering whether she's on Botox or not. Uh, so we haven't seen her in the, in the media for a while now, but uh, you could imagine her, she was uh, heavy into politics. And, uh, you know, unfortunately for her, um, you know, American politics in particular, uh, you know, are, is dominated by men. And, um, you know, so part of this whole thing, right, is, uh, you know, you're trying to be a, a powerful politician. And so you dye your hair, you put in, uh, put in contact lenses, you use a little Botox, and maybe it won't remind you of your grandma, but maybe it looks like somebody who's vibrant and young. And um, I don't blame her for this, and it's, it's just unfortunate that politics is that way. But um, anyway, like I said, lots of celebrities and other people are, are using it, and, and uh, I've even seen advertisements in town, so there's clearly some people in Fort McMurray using it. So what about another endo or exotoxin? that is actually very similarly related to the tetanus toxin. So the picture actually looks very similar. The, the tetanus toxin, um, this organism, same thing, another clostridium, also a soil organism, and it kind of does the opposite thing. So rather than paralyzing, people will, uh, their muscles will be stuck in a, um, in a uh, contracted way. So sometimes tetanus is called lockjaw. Uh, if you get it in your, uh, in your, your facial muscles, um, you know, the, the jaw gets locked and people can't move it. Uh, it can be very painful, right? People, you know, they, their muscles tense and they can't uh, relax them and can be, be very, very painful. Uh, there's this um, famous painting here of a wounded uh, soldier suffering from tetanus and it looks, uh, looks very, very painful. So just, just go back to this. Notice I have the rusty nail and there's always everyone talking about, oh, if you, if you, get, if you get scratched by a rusty metal, uh, you should get your tetanus shot. Uh, you know, your booster for your tetanus shot. Um, it's, about, it's good for about 10 years, by the way. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but uh, tetanus, you know, this organism doesn't necessarily grow on rust. Um, that's a misconception. It's found associated with, with soil. So anywhere where something might be dirty. So a rusty natal is usually dirty and found in a dirty location often. And, um, and of course the nail itself uh, is puncturing the skin. And so, you know, there's, there's a good connection there, but it's not necessarily related to rust. It's uh, related to soil. And uh, if you do get tetanus and your shot's not up to date, you can, you can get antibiotics. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, um, but you just, hopefully you don't get it to the point where you're, um, uh, you're in this much pain. So a little diagram here showing, again, your nerves and your muscles. And take a look on the top. Um, it's showing, I thought I had two pictures here. Maybe I don't. It's basically when you have your nerves, um, you have two types of uh, contraction. You have two types of neurotransmitters. One of them telling your muscle to contract, another telling it to relax. 
So the tetanus to toxin actually prevents the, uh, the relaxation part. So you can tense your muscles, but not relax them. So just uh, blocking a different neurotransmitter. Oh, there's the other picture there. Maybe I just had them in the wrong order. Um, anyway. Okay, moving on. Uh, I'm realizing we're, we're just getting short on time here, but I'm, I'm almost done what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, there's a whole bunch of toxins that fit this category, these AB toxins. And uh, just want to show this to you because it's important for vaccines. So you take a look, there's two parts, an A part and a B part. The B part attaches to the host cell and lets A part in. So the B part isn't actually doing any damage to you, which is good. The A part is the part that uh, you know, does something nasty. So in the case of the cholera toxin, it's uh, modifying chloride channels, which uh, kind of allows uh, you know, uh, fluids to, to uh, get expelled to your gut and leads to a very, uh, very watery diarrhea. So why is this important? It turns out there's a whole bunch of toxins that have this uh, kind of system here, this AB system. And the two that I wanted to point out here are the uh, pertussis toxin and the diphtheria toxin, right? So why did I circle the blue part? Because it turns out that the pertussis toxin and the diphtheria toxin, uh, that's what's used in the vaccines. So in the vaccine, we basically, we remove this red part, the part that does the nasty stuff, right? And, uh, and we keep the blue part. And so we get an immune response against the toxin and that, can, that is enough to prevent disease. So you can still get colonized by that organism. In fact, many of us uh, right now probably have the diphtheria organism living in us right now in the back of our throats. Uh, and we're perfectly healthy because we've had, the, um, we've had the, uh, the vaccine and it's preventing the disease. Uh, ricin, by the way, is, is a very nasty um, uh, poison. I don't know if that's the one that was featured in Breaking Bad. I think somebody asked me about that last time. Uh, I really, I'm really not sure. So there are a few things out there that are sort of like toxins. Um, again, you know, you've got all this di different naming going around um, here. Um, this one here, this TSST1 toxin from Staphylococcus. Um, some of them are uh, also fit into a category of something known as a super antigen. And so uh, if you're a woman uh, and if you've used uh, tampons, you've probably seen uh, a warning like this. Uh, I don't know if it's on the box or in the paper comes with the box talking about toxic shock syndrome. And uh, so by the way, um, you don't have to be a woman uh, or use tampons to get toxic shock syndrome. Anybody can get it from a blood infection, a staphylococcus blood infection. Not all staphylococcus can do this, but certain strains, they, they have this toxin. And so uh, this toxin, for some reason, the immune system just goes crazy. And uh, it can lead to uh, symptoms very similar to septic shock, so fever and low blood pressure, uh, toxic shock syndrome can actually be a lot worse. In some cases can lead to organ failure. Uh, don't really know the mechanism behind it. So you're probably wondering what is the association with tampons? Um, so it turns out that uh, I don't know when this was, um, could have been the 1990s or something like that. Uh, it could have been even earlier. Uh, um, there was uh, at least one or two companies and they were making, uh, you know, prepare to be grossed out by the way, they were making these super absorbent uh, tampons. And um, <laughs> super absorptive, meaning that you could leave them in apparently for the entire duration of your period. Okay, yeah, I know, I know. People are thinking, okay, whoa, well, that is too much. Um, but think about what you're doing now in that particular situation, okay? You're making a blood culture, right? You have, an, you have, uh, you have blood, um, a warm incubating environment, and, uh, and then the organism has a chance to grow and pop, propagate. And then once it gets access to the bloodstream and sec secrete that. Um, so you still end up with some people um, that uh, I, I don't, um, not being a woman, I don't know how this works, but uh, some people forget them sometimes uh, in there for too long and whatnot. Um, uh, you know, I don't know whether that's or inexperienced teenagers or, or what the situation is there. I don't know enough about it, but uh, it does happen. And there are men that get toxic shock syndrome. Like I said, you can just stop about this bloodstream and you can get um, toxic shock syndrome. Okay, so lots of fun there. So let's talk a little bit about E. coli. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, like, like I see, keep telling you E. coli is good, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then I say, well, but then some of them are gonna make you sick. So I think I showed you this slide before. And I mentioned that uh, 
There's lots of strains of E. coli. Some are non-pathogenic. They aren't going to make you sick at all. Um, there's a handful that are pathogenic. You can see they have fancy acronyms. ETEC stands for Entero uh, something E. coli. Um, EP is Enteropathogenic E. coli and so on. And some are potentially pathogenic. So those include like the urinary tract infections where, you know, they're in the wrong place at the wrong time kind of thing. So let's talk about these pathogenic ones, why they are pathogenic compared to some of these other ones here. So um, here's a, a slide just saying, you know, how is E. coli making us sick? Mostly we're talking about gastrointestinal infections or urinary tract infections. Sometimes it gets to other wrong parts of the body, which can lead to a whole bunch of other things, um, which, is, which is unfortunate. So here's, here's the groups, there's the acronyms, and I wanna just talk about these briefly. Uh, I don't expect you to know all these acronyms and the differences necessarily between them all, by the way. So um, here is the UPEC, the uropathogenic ones. Like I said, I mentioned this is, um, can cause uh, urinary tract infections. And uh, sometimes there's association with uh, um, uh, people becoming sexually active and getting urinary tract infections. So it has a, an old name called honeymooners cystitis. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's recommended by a lot of, uh, a, a lot of medical, um, a lot of medical experts are, are recommending uh, after sexually act, sexual activity that women do go and urinate just to, just in case, you know, to clear the system. And, uh, you know, so, so what is going on there? Again, like I mentioned, the urethra and the anus are relatively close. And of course, uh, the vagina is in between. And so there is, there's the possibility to introduce bacteria from one system to another. Of course, uh, different types of sexual practices, I'm not gonna go into a list of, of various things, can, can lead to um, uh, you know, more frequency of infection. Uh, I, I know I read something a while ago talking about, um, uh, uh, apparently anal sex is, is more popular than it ever used to be. And of course, if somebody is going from anus to vagina, um, the introduction is a little bit more likely. Okay, so let's talk about the, um, about the gut pathogens. Um, there's a whole bunch of them here. And um, I'm just looking at the time here and see that I'm, I'm running out of time here a little bit. So I do, maybe I will have to come back to this, uh, but there's a couple of things that I do want to say uh, before we finish up here today. So notice, that I have this word here, and I had it with the cholera pa uh, pathogen, right? Enterotoxin. So this word entero, what does that mean? Entero means the gut. So if I said enterotoxin, enterotoxin means some sort of gut toxin that is doing something in your intestine, presumably, right? So usually that means diarrhea, sometimes bloody diarrhea, depending on, on the toxin. So if you see that thing, enterotoxigenic, it means it's, it's causing some sort of uh, pathogenesis to your, um, to your digestive system. Enterotoxin means a toxin that is affecting that part of the body. Uh, I'm just gonna skip ahead here. Uh, and like I said, I'll come back to this next day. I kinda wanted just to finish this mechanisms of, um, of a pathogenicity. And, uh, and the last part is portals of exit. So portals of exit just kinda means that the, uh, the organism has to get in you. It's gotta do all these things. But to infect the next person, it's got to get out of you and get to that next person. So you can see it's pretty much a lot of the same systems. Uh, respiratory disease, maybe you cough and that's how you're infecting the next person. Um, some diseases are fecal oral, meaning it's going in your one end and ending up out the other end, right? Uh, and that's how you're going to contaminate uh, the next person. And um, you know, all those kind of things, right? Um, sexually transmitted infections, you know, they're infecting the uh, urogenital tract and, you know, that's how they're gonna get out and infect the next person and so on. So um, I just wanted to kind of touch on, uh, you know, all these things, like I said, it's, it's a big long list of things um, that are causing pathogenesis. And uh, of, of course, I know some people are already thinking about the final exam. So I just wanted to mention the final exam for a moment that, uh, for this area here, it's, it's, um, there's, there's gonna be questions on this stuff. Some of them are gonna be kind of fill in the blank kind of questions like uh, uh, asking you, um, you, you know, um, list three ways that organisms can enter the body with examples or, you know, those kind of things. Some of them uh, are gonna be, uh, you know, around uh, uh, specific things, right? Uh, you know, you can imagine uh, asking, you know, what is, uh, uh, what is the parenteral route or something like that? 
So, um, you know, I, you're going to have to learn a lot of this, and I, I, got, I can't stress enough that it's really important to know examples. And uh, this is why I, I keep trying to bring up the same examples, um, rather than, you know, overwhelm you with, uh, you know, a thousand different organisms, uh, you know, talk, you know, you know, some of them pop up, like Klebsiella has popped up on a few slides. Don't worry about Klebsiella. I will never ask you about that. But Streptococcus, um, Staphylococcus, E. coli, right? These are, you know, I keep trying to bring you the same examples. And so it's good to know about some of these, these core organisms. Um, I will talk more about the final exam as, as, as time approaches uh, to it. And uh, I do welcome questions. If anybody has any about the final exam, I'll try to answer them. Uh, as we go along. So um, I was hoping to have this topic finished, which puts us slightly behind, but uh, there's not a lot left, mostly talking about E. coli and a couple of other things. And uh, um, so I'll finish it there. Somebody's asking what the average was for the second midterm. It was slightly lower than the first one, and I can't remember what the numbers were, but it was like maybe not even half a percent. So kind of similar um, to the first one. Anyway, um, I, well, uh, we're already over time, so we'll finish up, and uh, hopefully you have a, a wonderful weekend. I guess I will see you all next Tuesday. Don't forget that your assignments are due, and um, if you need any feedback or whatever, uh, you can reach out to me, and uh, I'll see what I can do about answering your questions. Can I ask a question?